welcome everybody. As you might know, I'm Greg Gordon, and you're joining us for our Music Business 210 guest lecture class here. And today, I am thrilled to have with me Eric Luttrell. Yeah, Eric, uh, yeah, let's hear for Eric. It's awesome. It's great because Eric, um, you know, we go back quite a few years now, right, yeah. Eric? 2008. Is it 2008? Uh, 12 years, yeah. Wow. It's amazing how long Pyramine's been doing this now yeah. and the fact that you've seen um, so many different successes now since you're, you know, coming out of Pyramine. And um, also, it's kind of cool because I recently had another interview with a, a fellow alum um, who's even prior to you. Um, and so it's, it's great to see alum from what, you know, the trajectories that they've taken since graduating. And I know, you know, Pyramine is just a part of your process, but I know it played a role early on because um, you, you had uh, um, a trio that you kind of put together. And I think Pyramine was kind of at the nexus of that. So talk a little bit about, you know, coming out of college and, and, and how this has kind of taken on a life of its own and how you've really been so... Uh, capable in driving uh, this kind of career path that you're on right now? Um, so, yeah, I graduated college in 2008. I went to UC Santa Barbara. And when I was there, I, like my last year there, I um, developed a, um, an interest in writing electronic music, um, partly due uh, uh, from the fact that I went to school in Berlin for like six months in college. And when I was there, I was like exposed to a lot of cool dance music that I never knew existed at all. So I was just uh, really like, you know, into that. I was like, whoa, there's this whole other side of music. I was really into music before. Um, I did a lot of like singer songwriter kind of stuff, which I still love, but I just was exposed to this whole other side of things that was happening and everything was like so different sounding and so cool. And I realized that if you have a computer, then you can just like, um, you can basically make whatever you want um, or whatever your you know, brain can think of or whatever you're <laughs> capable of making at the time. And um, yeah, so started making music on my computer in college. Uh, and what was your first uh, computer DAW experience like? What did you use? I was using a, a MacBook Pro, like 2006 MacBook Pro with Logic Express which was like the, mm -hmm. the like intro version of Logic before they had Logic Pro, or it was just like the, the cheaper version. Um, and yeah, I just sort of learned how to use all the stuff. I was, didn't really know what plugins were or anything like that. It was all just like in the box and I was, you know, I'd go back and listen to the stuff and it's like terrible, but it was really fun to make it at the time. And um, I feel like, you know, just, Having something like that was so like new and interesting to me, having the ability to do that and the tools to do it. Um, like I was just like uh, you know, super into making music and I started DJing in college and um, yeah, we were just super interested in the school. So we came and we did the program for a year. And um, now that you, during that program, is that when you met Andy? Too? Yeah, so the first, like I think the first day of that program we met Andy Coonan, who is, um, he was the third member of our first project that we started. It was a trio. And uh, yeah, the first day we just like vibed with him and uh, we were showing him music that we were into and he was like, whoa, like all that stuff's crazy. Like he was really into like Radiohead and uh, you know, that kind of like out there electronic music. Um, and yeah, so we just became really good friends and then about Midway through our experience Excuse at the school, we uh, we started our first group, uh, started like releasing music to blogs. At the time, like what you did when you were an independent artist is you just release music to blogs. You write a song or an EP. You go through. We would like amass a list of like 200 blogs that talked about dance music in general, and like we would just you know write them individually. Like, hey, so and so, like. This is our project. This is what we're all about. This is our like symbol. This is our um, our logo, or whatever. And that logo, so, that symbol was M Machine, right? 
It was, no, did it start with that or that no, evolved it was, into it was, that? So the first project was called Pants Party. Oh, I remember that because yeah. we released that on Test Press. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah so yeah, the yeah. first project was called Pants Party, uh -huh. like spelled like dance, like D-A-N-C-E, but with a P, so like Pants Party. And um, the, the project was very um, like tongue in cheek almost, like there was a lot of humor in the songs. And we didn't like, we intentionally were trying to like make stuff that was like a little bit abrasive and like really energetic and like kind of like funny at the same time. I remember um, the track we released, A Million Puppies. Yeah. Is that exactly, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. So the it's called song a million was called puppies. A Million Puppies. And there was like little, um, like we sampled like Mario Paint, uh, like little dog bark noises. And, uh, and then, yeah, like this like crazy build up into a drop that like, you know, it's like really shocking, but like now I listen to it and I'm like, oh my God, like how would anybody want to listen to that? It's so <laughs> abrasive and awful. But like the the more indie abrasive sounds was more what we were going for back then, as opposed to like the minimal techno. And you know, that minimal techno was like huge in 2007 in Berlin mm -hmm. and it's still huge in Berlin. Mm -hmm. And, um, but there was also this like side, like indie, um, you know, like the, some of you may know, Boys Noise, like that crew um, was doing like, they're in Berlin, but they were doing something a little left of center. Um, we wanted to emulate that a little more. Um, so it definitely had an influence, like the, some of the clubs and shows that I would go to out there, I'd like hear it and like see what the DJs were doing and, and like the vibes of the clubs. And like, I really, you know, liked the more like indie kind of scene as opposed to like the shiny fancy clubs I like the more like you know graffiti everywhere and like you know the djs are like right there and everything's like all dark and like you know gross um but in a cool way you know <laughs> yeah, yeah. and um so at the time that we were starting that um you know we were a few months into our program here at the school and there was an opening for a like studio manager um, to like basically watch the studio uh, after classes and help anybody that wants to uh, you know sign up for studio time in the afternoons the evenings or whatnot and you know get them the cables they need or um, you know hook stuff up for them and uh, much like we still do today yeah and I uh -huh. assume you probably do the same thing uh, now and uh, but in doing that, um, we got a lot of time in the studio just to ourselves and, you know, in between when other people were using it or there would be some nights when no one would get it, no one would uh, sign up and then we would have the place until from like 6 p.m. after classes and we'd stay until midnight and then... I think I kind of remember you guys staying even later than that sometimes. Sometimes, yeah, <laughs> definitely. I mean, as long as... Like coming like, in in the morning and there yeah, you guys... As long as we like, you know, <laughs> little bit, yeah, lock up and everything. But, um, but yeah, no, it's... Uh, it, I mean, like, just doing that, I think um, that gave us a lot of uh, extra time to just sit there and experiment and learn and, uh, you know, be together and, like, figure out what we all sort of had to bring to the table as far as creating a project together and like trying to make something that we could market and have be relatively successful. Um, so, so that was a big thing for sure, was just, um, you know, spending as much time here as possible uh, and like thinking of it as like every second is a chance to learn something new or learn a piece of gear or learn a new piece of software or you know, whatever so did you see it like the opportunity to come together with two other people is like a, a way to almost teach each other like learn from each other's strengths and through that collaborative totally. process I mean I think that it worked well because we all definitely brought different things to the table like Andy was definitely the smartest one out of all of us um, <laughs> and no, like he's seriously. Yeah, and he's like, like gone on to now, be yeah, a now coder, he, right? Now he works uh, at Google, like creating AI that like learns, it teaches itself how to write music. Oh boy. So that's what he's doing. He's going to put us all out of work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's like writing a, a, you know, a machine that can write its own like orchestral music. Yeah. Uh, right. 
and uh, and Swarty and I were, uh, you know, very into the music. And you know, Swarty's very social. He was he's like a social butterfly and definitely like not shy whatsoever. And I was more of the I was a little quieter and um, but loved writing music. And you know, all together, you know, Andy would. Know, if I couldn't understand something technical with like a synth or you know whatever, he was just like, oh, this way you do, mm -hmm. or you know something within a DAW or you know Ableton or Logic or whatever. It's like he just knows right away what to do. So having having a team that's like that, I think was really beneficial, um, where everybody uh, we were on like separate pages, but um, all together those separate pages made like a good little cohesive thing. It's one thing that uh, I think a lot of projects, and you know, there's nothing wrong with this, but I think a lot of projects when they start, or a lot of bands when they start, they almost use humor as um, a way to like uh, sort of protect yourself from like scrutiny or criticism, you know? Because, oh, it's like, you know, we're just fucking around and it's just a big joke and like, you know, we're just like making fun of the industry and like, you know, you know, we think the music's cool, but like, you know, it's not that serious and like, we don't take ourselves seriously, you know? And that's like a easy way to kind of avoid feeling like anyone can call you out for, you know, your music not being good or like whatever. I think it's not that it wasn't honest at the time, but I think there was an element of that to it. Um, and I think that's just being young and not and never have been in that position before. I think that's um, something that we did. The and position of what, being critiqued or the position The position of, of writing music and putting uh, it out to the public. You oh, know? yeah, yeah, okay. You know, like, mm -hmm. and having a band and working with a group. Um, and then as we got into the, the next uh, phase, we realized like, oh, like maybe we're writing music that is like, you know, serious and we're more comfortable and I think we're better at production now. And, um, you know, maybe it's time to like actually change up the project, change the name, come up with a new image or brand and you know, go in a, a direction that we're taking seriously and we want to do professionally and like really make a big thing, you know. And this was right about the time that we met Skrillex um, and he was getting booked by our booking agent at the time um, was this guy, Aaron Green. He reached out to us. He was a student at UC Santa Cruz, and he was booking at a club called Motive in Santa Cruz down there. Um, and he booked Pants Party to play. And when we went down and played a show, he's like, can I be your guys' booking agent? We're like, yeah, someone wants to be a booking agent. Great. And <laughs> uh, like... That must have felt good. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. A couple months later, he calls us and he's like, so I've got this guy coming into town. His name is Skrillex. He's, uh, this was 2010, I think. And um, he's like, yeah, like, you know, he's got a crazy sound that's like, like everybody thinks is going to get huge. And we're like, okay, like we'll come to the show. And so we drive down to Santa Cruz with him and we pick up Skrillex along the way. And we're listening to music with Skrillex in the car. And he's like, what are you guys like making these days? Like, and we didn't know him, like he was totally unknown at that point. And he was about to go play a show in front of like 10 people in Santa Cruz. And uh, he's like, yeah, what's up? Like, I didn't know his previous band or whatever. He was just some crazy looking guy. And uh, we're like, oh, like here's what we were working on. And it was um, a, uh, a unreleased Pants Party track that was like definitely more along the lines of that, like serious, heavy, emotional kind of stuff. And he's like, whoa, this is great. Like, uh, Would you have called that Electro House at that time? Was it was it? Electro House, yeah. yeah like Electro yeah. House, Progressive House, maybe. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, but yeah, he was like, he's like, this is really cool. Like, I think in the next like year or so, I'm going to start a label. So like, send me some stuff like, if you want, you know. And uh, and then, you know, fast forward, you know, six months, a year down the road, uh, we've amassed like. You know, a little EP that we were calling the M Machine, and just to insert here, just one second, who inspired that name? Who came up with M Machine? What was that? 
So initially we were called Metropolis. That's what we were calling ourselves because we were really into like the imagery from Metropolis, the movie. Like uh -huh. the old I remember the video that kind of evolved yeah. out of that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So um, we were super into like that whole imagery and that style, that like future from 100 years ago, like what people thought the future would look like a century ago. We like thought that was really cool. And, um, and we thought it fit the vibe of the music well because the, the music was very like heavy and dark and like. Um, we used a lot of like orchestral elements and stuff, but um, yeah, we, uh, let's see, we reached out to him with our EP, because at the same time, our booking agent uh, was turning into our manager at the time, uh, Aaron, and he was working with another guy, Neil, and they their only project was uh, this group, Metropolis, that ended up, we ended up getting a cease and desist from a band in Minneapolis called Metropolis. So we like had to come up with a new name, back to your point. Ah, uh, and I didn't the know that. M machine is uh, like the power uh, structure underneath, underneath the uh, ground that's powering the city. And it's like, you know, all of these like second class citizens that like are working to power the city. That's like this future, futuristic utopia, but like they don't get to partake in any of that. Yeah, we just thought the M machine was a cool name, and we were like, you know, we could use this M symbol that Andy came up with, and then Andy's like, I can build a light show, I can build this like big uh, LED light wall. You know, he, he taught himself how to solder and how to do everything, how to like code it and all that. I remember so, that was a big deal, because I, yeah. I remember when you guys were talking about that and yeah. how excited he was about it. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. and we used that, we traveled around with that as we started to get the project going and um, like another person that was involved with us early on in that project um, was Porter Robinson and Porter was friends with Pants Party online like we would chat on like MySpace back in the day like Pants Party and Porter Robinson's early project it was called uh, Echo Wraith and that was like a hands up like hard style like super ravey thing um, like one 70 BPM, like crazy stuff, like uh, dance, dance, revolution music. Uh, long story short, he ends up signing on with uh, our management, and uh, which was slush management, and I'm not sure when they call started calling it that, but um, now they have a pretty big roster. But um, yeah, that was the beginning, and then Porter released a EP on Ausla, which is Skrillex's label, and we released an EP right after that on Ausla, and um, yeah, we kind of just got our start all at the same time, and you know, Porter obviously just skyrocketed into oblivion, um, and you know, deservedly so. He's like one of the best musicians and producers out there. So, um, and we could all see it. We all knew it. Like right away, we're like, whoa! Like this kid is ultra talented. Um, now and at yeah. that time, weren't you guys also doing some remixes that were getting some notoriety? Wasn't that a component of this process <sighs> yeah. for you guys? Yeah, so definitely we would do bootleg remixes. Um, anything that we liked and we felt like we could remix, we would try. Like we'd remix like, uh, well, this is back in the day, but we'd remix like Hot Chip and like uh, everything from like Hot Chip to like Shakira. And uh, <laughs> and then, but those were like just bootleg remixes we put out on the internet and you know gained some attention, but not really. And uh, but then when we were the M Machine, we you know got a little more serious. We had some releases with Skrillex's label, and um, we started getting uh, you know asked to do remixes for like you know Atlantic Records for like um, we got asked to do one for Bruno Mars. That was a big one. Um, uh, forgot what song. Oh, Locked Out of Heaven. That was that was the track, um, and yeah, and that like got picked up by like Sirius Radio. We got some good radio play there. Um, yeah, and then the whole thing like that was 2011, and then or 2012, and then we just toured, toured. You know, brought the M around. We ended up doing a video show too that Andy created um, and 
got brought on the Porter Robinson tour. So we got to go out with him and Matt Zoe tour around the country in a bus. That was really fun. And lots of good shows there. Um, got to play some big festivals like EDC and um, like Hard Summer and that kind of stuff. I remember seeing you guys at Outside Lands. Yeah, guys, we played Outside Lands. I, I saw, I, re I remember we were all so excited to come see you guys and, and to see the big M on yep. the stage on uh, at Outside yep. Lands. That was cool. Yep. Even so, though it was all foggy and cold out, you yeah, guys killed it. Yeah, and it was like noon. We were the first act. Um, uh -huh. But but it was still super fun, and we had a good little you know group that came out totally. to see it. So, uh -huh. uh, yeah, we got a lot of cool opportunities, and you know a lot of it, I will admit for sure, was just sort of being in the right place at the right time. Like, randomly, our booking agent is booking Skrillex before he's famous, and randomly our, uh, you know, spray art uh, roommate from the warehouse was listening to Port Robinson and you know showed us this track that we were like oh that's awesome when we reached out and it just happened that we knew him anyways like these are all just like totally random things um, but but not, to not I mean I guess totally random it's like they seem totally random but they're not really like I was just they gonna were, say that. Yeah, yeah they were like all like the reason why we had those connections uh, was because we were like like writing music at that time and trying to spread ourselves as far as we could in all directions within that industry and at the level of like other people that were new in it too you know so we mm -hmm. weren't like like you know shooting you know uh, you know super high with like all the connections that we were making we were we were just trying to meet other people that were in our, you know, at our stage in their career. Um, so that's really cool to see. Are you still with works. the same management now, or is Anjuna no. now completely taken over? So that role? for my current project, Latrell, um, yeah, I guess in the story, we're like, haven't even gotten to Latrell stuff yet, but yeah, so um, the M Machine, we uh, haven't done any. <coughs> like music or shows together for a long time. Um, when was the last show you guys did together? 2017 for our uh, last album tour. Um, we did an album called Glare and at that point Andy had already moved on to another job uh, but Swarty and I were still living together and writing music. And um, Andy really wasn't down with the whole touring thing, right? He wasn't. No, he was. He, was. he, yeah. he, uh, he just saw like um, he knew that he was talented in coding and uh, you know he had a big opportunity to start a career in that and he took it and like there's and we were fully supportive of it like it's it's hard being in a band for like working with the same group of people for seven years and like writing music and being dead broke the whole time you know like we were we were broke like all the way until you know close to you know, the end, I would say like 2013, 2014 is like when we finally were like not living completely month to month, you know? So, um, yeah, it just, in splitting the money between three people is really hard too. Yeah. yeah. Um, Cause you're paying your management a fee and then you're paying, at that point, uh, we thought we had to have a lawyer cause that's what bands do to have lawyers, I guess. So we were paying a lawyer fee. Like, in retrospect, do you feel like that wasn't really necessary? Totally not. Uh -huh. um, like, if you need a lawyer, just hire a lawyer by the hour, and it's way cheaper. Um, How were you paying your lawyer? A percentage. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So don't do that unless you have some weird thing where like you have to do that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think for for the most part, for a small group, there's it's not necessary to do that because. Yeah. Do you feel you were misled into that, or was that just a, was that a conscious decision well, on your guys' part? I don't know if we were like misled necessarily because at the time we didn't know how big the project was going to get, and we were we were you know we were all in with the with the M Machine project. We're like you know going and you know, uh, you know, shopping it to all these different labels, like shopping an album to different labels, and like we were 
you know, building this big stage piece and we were you know gonna shoot for the stars you know we were like thinking we were gonna get this thing like huge and that was our that was our mindset and so at the time it seemed like like having a lawyer just in case anything came up or whatever was a good thing and I'm sure a lot of big acts do have lawyers that they need a lot but we just never reached the point where we actually needed our lawyer that much and if we had paid them by the hour to like sign the generic uh, release agreement you know that we would get from most releases we did then we would have paid so much less money to them so that was a learning experience for sure and um, and that's what I do now I don't pay a lawyer uh, a fee um, and if I need one I just get one for hourly rate um, but it's your yeah. lawyer now do you work with a local locally based lawyer if you do or do um, you? no uh, they're actually in the UK mm -hmm. um, but is that because Anjuna is based in, in the UK yeah 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 so uh -huh. um, but even now it's like you, you don't all of the agreements are that I've I've never signed like a major label agreement and maybe those are way different and like uh, but the, uh, the agreements that I've gone into they're they're fairly straightforward and if you have somebody just look over it and make sure they, there's no like tricks in there that's all you need you, like mm -hmm. it's uh, it's you know, it's not that crazy but um, anyways yeah so uh, the M machine ran till 2017 that was when we uh, really kind of stop touring and uh, but during during that process you guys made some really cool videos some animated videos i remember oh yeah, yeah. There were, they were some really high-end videos how did yeah, you how did you do that 2014 how did you manage to do that pull that off uh we just emailed people um so for instance the uh the animated one that i think you're talking about the um this the little Martian landing yeah, thing. Yeah, the song called Tiny Anthem. That's the uh, one, yeah. yeah Have any of you guys seen any of these videos, by the way? They're pretty cool. They're pretty cool. Yeah. Definitely recommend it. Um, we got the guy, the people who did, um, it's a studio called uh, Augenblick Studios in Brooklyn. Um, they did Super Jail, and um, if any of you guys know that, it was a cartoon or Adult Swim uh, thing, and a few other cartoons on Adult Swim. Um, but yeah, we sent them the track and we're like, you know, our, uh, we really want to do, we love super jail a lot. Like we make all of our friends watch when they come over cause it's like so crazy. And I don't know if anybody here has seen super jail, but it's like super weird. Um, but cool. And, um, and we're like, here's the song. Uh, we, can pull together a budget from the label we think and, and that label at that time was, was Oslo. Oslo. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and so they were supportive yeah mm -hmm. I mean they you know advanced us the money so we had they had to recoup it but we didn't have to pay out of pocket right then and there um, which was cool and yeah and the studio was like yeah we have we're right in the middle of two projects right now and we're totally always down to do um, you know something with a, a musical group and um, they liked our idea that we were kind of just pitch them like a simple idea and they're like, yeah, like, let's go with that. So, but then sometimes a music video will really catch on and like really elevate a project, you know, that's already existed for a long time, but then like they'll release some video and everyone starts talking about it. So if the idea is good enough and it's produced the right way, then uh, it could be great. So, uh, yeah, but don't get me wrong, I am super proud of what we did, and I'm not saying that it wasn't necessary or it was a mistake or anything, but I just, uh, I think people should always be super careful when they're investing that much money into something, like really weigh the potential pros and cons. Like maybe it'll catch fire and like do really well. Maybe it'll, you know, do okay. Maybe no one really will even see it, and then it's a huge waste of money so we continued writing uh, we changed our sound a little bit we went a little more like club soundy for our um, in between the metropolis era stuff 
we went a little more clubby, a little more bass housey. Uh, we were definitely influenced by like the Dirty Bird thing that was blowing up at the time, like 2013, 2014. Um, and uh, then we we're like, wait, let's write a full length album of like, you know, more indie music. So we were like, uh, cause we were working on one back when Andy was still with the group. And then Andy left about midway through that process. Cause we kind of got bogged down with an album cause writing a full length album with three people is actually really hard. Cause there's so many ideas floating around. Um, and so Swarty and I went back and we finished it up and we put it out and we toured, uh, did like a North America tour off that and, and that was, how did you guys perform that what did you do we, what was your stage so we dj'd um uh -huh. that one uh -huh. and we got um andy made us uh like visuals so so that we could perform from stage so we had a computer and a controller to run visuals and then we dj'd on um cdj you know, cdj's yeah uh -huh. and we would if a song was too like or not dancey enough from the album because some of it is just like listening music and we would do a uh, we would just like remix it ourselves and do a more like clubby version with like you know drops and build ups and stuff kind of as were, a ma as a mashup or would you actually take the stems and do a remix on it we would just take the stems and do a remix yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and and that was really fun because uh, mm -hmm. it's like remixing your own music is super fun like i that was the first time i had actually tried that and um, yeah sometimes you come up with ideas that you just like didn't know that song had a potential to like go to this place, but it did. And you just had to like hear all the parts separately after you had written them and then like start from a new place and see where it goes. Yeah, sometimes you don't really realize the value of the content you've already created, right? Totally. That yeah. you can really get a lot of mileage. Or even just one element, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like like, oh, like this one string part is like super beautiful or like, you know, this one like arpeggio is really great, but like it's totally lost in the mix of the original track. So if you like take it out and you make that a focal point, that, that could be super, super cool on its own, you know? So uh, yeah, uh, 2017 or, and then about 2015 when we were still finishing up the album and in between finishing the album and then getting it mastered and doing the, like plans for the rollout, I was starting to work on my side project, uh, Latrell, and I was, uh, I wasn't necessarily thinking I was gonna like leave the M machine or that the M machine was done with and we were gonna go our separate ways. I was just like, I have some free time on my hands and I love writing progressive house and melodic deep house kind of stuff. And and you're good at it. I'm just going <laughs> to I'm just going to do that and then like I'll put it out for free on SoundCloud and just have this like creative outlet that is just my brain making music and like you know I don't have to make any concessions or whatever, you know. So um, I thought it would just be nice sort of like therapeutic thing to do. Um, and so I wrote and wrote and ended up with like six tracks I think that I was like, okay, like these are these are good enough to like share with people. And down at Matt Zoe's house, because Matt had started a label at that point, and we, he offered to put out the M Machine record because Ausla didn't want it because it was way too different from what they were doing at the time. And I don't blame them. Like they were putting out like super heavy, like dubstep. Yeah, like mm -hmm. lit trap music, and we were, were making like, like I was literally like playing acoustic guitar and like one of the songs, and like <laughs> it's like very fun and like you know super cool. Um, and still electronic, but like definitely not what Ausla was doing at the time. And um, yeah. So. Was that conscious? I mean, where you're like, you know, this is what I like. I don't, you know, even totally, though Ausla's yeah. blowing up, I don't oh, yeah. know that. No, we, we wanted to write an album like that, you know, something more along the lines of like, you know, something of like Empire of the Sun or like, you know, MGMT or something just a little um, more singer songwriter influenced or like you know indie electronic kind of influence kind of stuff not necessarily club bangers you know um, not that we don't love club bangers too it's just that was at the time we we're like that's where our mind was we're like, this is what we're gonna do yeah you know? and um, which that's another thing uh, I think that's another thing that I think 
hurt that project, uh, DM Machine, is we, I think we changed a bit too much uh, from release to release. And, and like, you definitely don't want to do the same thing over and over again, because uh, that will, people will just eventually get kind of bored of that and you have to like evolve somewhat. But I think we were, we, we loved so many different types of music and so many different types of electronic music that we were just like, like we're doing this now. And then like, ooh, this is really cool. Like, let's try that. Let's do a whole release around that. And then, ooh, like let's try you know, this new thing. And you know, let's sing on all of our tracks. And like, uh, and, and all of it by itself, if you listen to each one in, in, by themselves, um, they're, I'm super proud of everything we did and like, it's all great and you know, it's beautiful stuff. But to, from the listener's perspective, I can totally understand how they would hear from release to release and be like, uh, like, is this the same like group or like, you know, do I, like, I really love this stuff. Do I want to go to this show if this is what they're going to play? Or like, you know, I, I feel like we definitely uh, confused people. And I think confusing fans is bad. Like surprising them and uh, can, be, can be good, but I think confusing them is bad. And I think that hurt us for sure. Um, so that's something that I would say if you guys are starting projects right now or like if you do in the future, um, just keep in mind that if you do make something that doesn't fit or like that is like a, a big departure from your current sound, just create a side project and like call it something else and do that. And you can tell your fans of this project, hey, like if you like this stuff, I've got another thing that I, you know, have worked on. It's called this and it's like, I've always loved this kind of music and I wanted to have an outlet to do that. And definitely some of your fans will probably like that. And I think they'll appreciate the honesty. Um, and, and it'll just give you the creative output to do that, or um, outlet to do that. And uh, yeah, I think that's what DM Machine probably should have done. We probably should have just created a, a few different projects to fit our different sounds. Um, but uh, yeah, so. That's a big word to the wise right there. I mean, that, that's, I think that's hugely important yeah. to, to note that because you guys did have a kind of a big diversity of releases that yeah. kind of I would say almost like would bifurcate your fan base especially now with fans being so niched mm -hmm. right everybody's like this is my sound I'm really into this totally. and so the minute you kind of spin out they're like wait a minute I thought you were this but now you're that yeah and people don't really get that you're just doing different things yeah. they, they it confuses them right yeah it's hard to yeah, yeah and, convey that. and and it's like a really simple solution that we just uh, didn't really think about and that's just do multiple projects. And people do that all the time, you know, like successful acts do, they'll, they will have multiple projects and, uh, and separating them uh, gives them each an opportunity to be successful, you know. But if you combine, uh, if you keep them combined and you deliver them as the same thing, as the same brand, but it's like a totally different vibe, then yeah, you just confuse people and it's, uh, I think a lot harder. Maybe for some people or for some bands, they're lucky and they can do it. Um, you know, like Radiohead, for example. Like, you know, they they make stuff that you know is way over here, and then they'll make something way over here, and their fans love everything. You know, they're like obsessed. Um, but I think those are that uh, situation is few and far between, and those are the outliers. You know, mm -hmm. um, and I think most bands they. Uh, they don't benefit from that. But anyways, so my side project, Latrell, I was starting uh, when we were finishing in uh, finishing the album and uh, I was at Matt Zoe's house. I don't know if you guys know who Matt Zoe is. He's a you know, very, very talented uh, producer. He does like electro and drum and bass and like all sorts of good stuff, but he's just like very, very uh, prolific. He's, he's works fast and he's very very talented um, but he's got a label and um, we released the M machine record on his label and we were down there he was helping us mix the last few things uh, on the album and 
and then afterwards we were just hanging out and he was showing us music that he was working on just on the side because he's got side projects too and um, then he's like what are you guys working on just like by yourselves because everyone you know even if you're in a group you're always just working on like little things here and there and I was like oh I've got this side project that I'm working on right now like let's like, listen to it here and so we're sitting in his studio and he's like what are you going to do with this stuff and I was like I don't know like thinking just give it away on SoundCloud and like you know be like delivered as like this is my side project I've always been passionate about this kind of thing and um, really want to you know have this creative outlet on the side and uh, then he was like he's like dude like you should send this to Angina Deep and I knew Angina Deep at the time and none of their music really sounded a lot like what I had there like it was you know maybe the same tempo but like totally a different vibe or at least in my mind it was tempo wise you're talking like what? 120 to 125 uh -huh. you know um, and uh, and like Angina Deep at the time was like very, very chill electronic, like super pretty. And mm -hmm. uh, I had elements of that stuff in it, but then I had elements that were like definitely a little bit like heavier and darker, but in the literal stuff that I, my first little EP that I was gonna just you know, give out. But uh, he was like, he's like, no, I think they'll like it because it like doesn't sound exactly like what they're putting out right now. So like, and he was right. They were like, they were into it. And, or at least I think four out of the six tracks that I sent over, they were into. And ended up putting out a single with them. So did he send the tracks over on your behalf or did he? He did, yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah he yeah. emailed them to just, I mean, it, he emailed them, I think to the same person that if you go on their website and you send it to demos at Ingenuity, it's mm -hmm. like goes to the same person. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, yeah, so he emailed it. He was like, Eric's my friend. He you know, used to, or he had, uh, he's been working at the M Machine for this amount of years, and this is his new side project. Take a listen. And then didn't hear from them for like a month or something, or, you know, a long time. And then, but then they got back and they were like, hey, like, you actually really like this stuff. Like, um, we'd love to, like, sign it as an EP with, like, a single first. And, uh, or these tracks that like these tracks we like think are pretty cool but they're not right for us or whatever and uh, yeah so ended up uh, signing a EP deal with them and uh, they invited me to uh, play a couple shows um, they were doing a showcase tour uh, at you know smaller to medium sized venues and they had me opening up for, it was me, um, this guy Theo Cottis, a Scottish guy, and Yato. Um, some of you guys might know Yato. He's a pretty big progressive house um, dude, deep house. Um, but yeah, so I got to go on this tour with them, opening up, and uh, and you know being the opening act at like a club at like opening at what eight or nine or doors or whatever it was like. A lot of the times I was opening to no one, but like, you know, midway through there would actually be like a decent amount of people there and I got to play all these new tracks and I got to play, um, you know, sets that were all like melodic techno and like progressive house and I just never had the opportunity to do that in my entire life or in my entire musical career. So that was, I was just like so stoked to have this creative outlet finally um, that was like just mine and and just have this like uh, opportunity to sort of dive into that world and meet all these new people and um, you know make a lot of good new friends and stuff. And so that was 2016. And were you touring when they put you on tour? Was that in Europe or was that in the States? That was the US. That was so, the US. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, they're actually, Angina Deep, the, the uh, label is, I think, I think their biggest market is North America um, and London or UK. UK, they're UK based, and then so they're they're big there. They're big in North America, and um, but uh, they are doing some shows across Europe and stuff um, this summer. So I'm gonna some be playing festivals. Some, yes, yeah. I'm gonna be playing some shows with them in, in Europe this summer. 
they're a super great team to be involved with. They're like very the Indrina umbrella is just like they uh, they're super professional and they just have like uh, you know they attract a certain type of person. I think that I really just happen to get along with. Um, in terms of your, when you say attract, you're talking about the brand itself and the audience that it attracts? Or totally, the, the yeah. the people that work for it? And maybe all of both, it. Right? All of it, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like, because each brand, each, uh, you know, label or um, scene or whatever has like its own vibe, you know. Um, so, you know, if you go to a dubstep show, it's it's very dubstep-y, you know. Mm -hmm. If you go to a deep house show, it's very deep house-y. If you go to a techno show, it's very techno-y. Mm -hmm. And all the people, um, and I think Angina has just a pretty broad spectrum of people that it attracts, um, you know, and it's not so, um, like, niche, and um, it's a little more, uh, it's not so exclusive, and I don't know, they it doesn't seem like people carry themselves like they think they're like the coolest thing ever, you know? Like, mm -hmm. And that's, some scenes I just feel like, um, you know, not to talk shit on any scenes, and maybe this is totally wrong, but like, I don't know, some scenes they seem very exclusive and like, you know, kind of like, oh, like if you aren't into this, and like you just like shitty music or something, you know? So, um, and yeah, so I just, I really like how um, Inchin Deep is very, or Ingina in general, like Ingina Beats and Ingina Deep are just, they're pretty like just open-minded and like um, open to different types of sounds for their labels. So like my music sounds totally different from Yato's music, which sounds totally different from Ben Boomer's music, but we're all on the same label. On know? the Deep label. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that's really cool. Uh, I mean, it's not totally different, it's not like it's one of us is writing like down tempo hip hop or something and one of us is writing deep house. It's like they're all in the same general range, but like the textures and the vibe and the chord progressions and like the all the things that give it characteristic, um, those are different. And uh, I think that's really cool. But yeah, so um, that sort of brings brings it to today. And, so how many releases do you have now out on Anjuna? I don't know. Uh, maybe like, <laughs> definitely like, maybe like 15 or something like that. Um, I mean, I've done an album, plenty of singles, plenty of remixes. Um, I have my second album coming out this Friday. Um, yeah, that's why we're, we're super lucky to have you here today. I feel like it's really fortuitous and the timing is great. Totally, yeah. So just, why don't we, well, let's talk about the second album. Let's talk about it a little bit. Yeah, um, so it's called Lucky Ones. Um, it's my second album in two years. So I've been, like right after I finished the last album tour, I was like writing right away, just like working on the next one. And that's uh, due in large part, uh, my management like really, pushing me they're like they're like you gotta like you know, start working on the next one even before the tour was over they're like they're like let's let's do the second album let's get it like started so you know so it's done by next november so we can come out next spring and did you work on it on the road while you were touring at all so not like on the road on the road but like in between shows because um, when i do these tours it's usually like three days on uh, four days off three days on four days off so you would actually fly back? Yeah, so oh. fly home and just work there. Um, but uh, yeah, the... And you got the, the home studio set up now, yep. I'm presuming, and you just come back and crank yep. on it? Yep. Mm -hmm. And all the What's music. in your home studio? Just tell us a little about your home studio for a second. Uh, so, I mean, it, it's pretty simple, uh, pretty simple setup. It's like a 2012 iMac that I've been using since the M Machine days. Um, and You're still using Logic? Yep, still mm -hmm. using Logic, but I'm on like the 2015 Logic uh, because I haven't updated my computer in that long because my computer crashed back then. And then once it came, once I got it fixed and brought it back, I was like really afraid of anything, like losing anything or losing any plugins. So I would, I just like skipped all the major updates. And so I'm living in like 2015 
Mac, <laughs> Mac world, Logic world, um, which I don't really care because it's it's Logic X, so it's like I don't have like the newest of the new stuff, but um, you know I can download plugins that can emulate things like you know, pitch shifting and stuff like that. But um, yeah, uh, uh, let's see what else I have a. I have a mini log that's a uh, analog synthesizer, little cord. Mm -hmm. um, that thing is awesome. That's super fun uh, and relatively inexpensive when it comes to analog gear. So that's the only piece of like actual analog gear I have. Um, what do you use for an interface? Uh, just a focus right little red box, scarlet, uh -huh. scarlet thing. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yep. So. Super cheap, nothing crazy. Um, definitely just gets the job done. I mean, I, I work in headphones exclusively, pretty much, because I'm in an apartment building and I can't make noise. Um, so, yeah. Uh, but So no crazy big studio no, setup? Yeah. You're doing it all in the box? Yeah. And Any contro fun controllers other than the uh, um, I have a machine, uh -huh. um, which I you know make drum beats on sometimes, but you know, lately I've been doing been uh, just getting a lot of my drum sounds off of uh, splice and just you know like dragging little pieces of audio in and just sort of creating it from there and they're just royalty free so you don't have to and it and it saves time too because like you can like working with other artists is really fun but sometimes you get somebody in the studio and you work you know two days in the studio with someone and then it just isn't meshing it's like just not working you know mm -hmm. and um so Splice is a good, a good tool to just come up with like really quick ideas and uh, like find something and make it harmonize in your track and just move it around, stretch it or whatever, you know, and they're do you like for, Do you like working with vocals like that? Yeah, so um, I mean, not, not in every track, but lots of tracks I'll just, you know, even if it's just like a little like sound, like, uh, like hey, or like, uh, just like a harmony, like, uh, like, you know, over, you can take that, you can pitch it to whatever you want and put it over, like, put it over a drop or like put it over a buildup and like put it through a huge reverb and spread it or like put it through a tremolo or, you know, have it moving around. Um, and yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's, you know, writing computer music, so you can do whatever you want and <laughs> it's really fun and like, yeah, it's, and you know, I still, I've been writing music like this for 13 years now, and uh, you know, I still feel like every time I write a song, pretty much every time I write a song, I learn something different, or like I learn a new trick, or like something that I stumble across, and I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool, you know, like, and um, I think if you're using that, I mean, it's really whatever you know best. Because um, they all, they all produce music, and it's all <coughs> just a workflow thing, you know. So, um, but. so how many how many days a year would you say you're touring now with Anjuna? How many how many shows are they putting you out on? Uh, well, I did a, a twenty five show tour last year for my album, um, and then I played definitely a lot of festivals and you know some more random gigs. Um, I got brought out to do a, um, a private party in New York. That was really cool, like an engagement party. This family just like got in touch with my management. For, like, can we get Patrol to come out and DJ this thing? It's like totally unannounced, and but he can just come and do the show for this wedding thing or engagement party. And you know, it was super like fancy party with sushi and all sorts of like. <laughs> that was pretty rad. Uh -huh. um, Probably paid pretty well, huh? Yeah, definitely it was not bad. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I don't know, maybe like maybe like 80, 80 shows mm -hmm. in a year, mm -hmm. something like that, 80 to 100 maybe. So what's next yeah. for Latrell? You're so, dropping this album? Yeah, the You got to be excited about that, huh? Oh, yeah. So yeah. yeah, I got this new album, 11 new songs, um, working on, I've been, since I've been home the past couple months, I've been writing what's hopefully going to be the next album, um, so or at least a good chunk of it. Like I've got like five 
out of the stuff I've been working on, like the different projects, I've got like five that I'm pretty stoked about and um, are probably going to become like actual songs. So, um, yeah, I'm excited. Well, about well talk about, just that's briefly cool. talk about what, what is the process like with Anjuna when you're writing the new album? Do they, do you have to go through like an approval process? Are you submitting the tracks? Are they yeah. giving you feedback while you're yep. producing it? Yep. So talk, yeah, so, tell yeah. us a little so, about that process. So for this current album, Lucky Ones, um, there was uh, maybe like back during like midsummer, I would say I had maybe like 15 songs that I was like, okay, like these, they're not all finished yet, but like, out of these 15 songs, I'm going to have an album, you know, whether that's 10 of them or 12 of them or whatever, like, like there is an album here in some order, you know? And so I took those works in progress and have, I have a Dropbox folder that's like called Latrell album two works in progress or, uh, not sure what it was exactly, but, um, basically, the label a and r guys um, have in my management have access to that folder and so when i would like you know get something in there or get it into something that sort of resembled what i thought would be a good album i would tell them i'd be like hey guys like take a take a listen through give me feedback and then we'd have a a google sheets google doc and um, have everybody that was listening to it from the label side and my management side, uh, you know, have their name and then the track and their feedback on it. So got like you know, six, six different people's feedback on each work in progress. And, um, you know, sometimes those conflicting stuff, like some people would love a certain thing and some people would be like, eh, like, I, you know, it's not for me or whatever. And, um, yeah, so I, I would, you know, obviously take everybody's opinion seriously um, and criticism seriously because, you know, I want, I want to make music that, you know, a lot of people like. Um, and, but I didn't have to, uh, I wouldn't say, like, I was ever forced to, like, I think if I, if I was like, this is it, this is what I want to put out, the label would they would probably, you know, out of those songs, they would be like, okay, cool, you know, but they would give me their honest feedback and like, they would never sugarcoat anything and they'd be like, we think this song is just not ready or like this song could be better if this section wasn't so like cluttered or something. And um, yeah, so I just uh, took all of that information and, you know, rethought things. Like I, I had some songs where I was singing on um, certain parts and you know some of them were like I don't know if that's really like the right vibe for this whole thing and and at first I was like like no like you know I, this is what I wanted to do but then I was like you know take a step back and actually like listen to it as a whole and like think about how the audience is going to perceive it through the lens of knowing Into Clouds my previous album and like you know coming to my shows and then and then their expectations as far as what they want to hear from a new Latrell thing um, which is you know the goes back to the lesson that I think I was just gonna say from, that right from the uh -huh. machine stuff yeah. is uh, it's like you do want to progress and you want to change and and you should it's just you have to do it in a way that's like not going to not gonna like alienate people that you know like your previous work you know yeah it's uh, not gonna freak them out yeah. or, or confuse them right yeah yeah so it's just like yeah like progressing and changing is great and uh but doing it in a way that is still that still sounds like it's related to your previous work i think that is the main thing need help with a mix music theory or production in logic ableton live or Pro Tools? Book a mentor session with one of our knowledgeable industry professionals today at peermind.com.